Next in World Languages Thursday. And next is World Languages. Let's get ready to learn. Hello, I'm Deanna Basilovac, World Languages Coordinator at Kansas City Public Schools. Thank you for joining me today. I'd like to talk to you about myself, give my background, talk about the languages that we offer in Kansas City Public Schools, and speak about the customs when introducing oneself in another country. Thank you for joining me. So I'm Deanna, and I'm originally from Kansas City. In fact, I have two grandparents that were from Kansas City, Kansas, and they were immigrants, and they didn't speak English, they spoke Polish. In fact, in their uh, community, they had bakeries, newspapers, everything was in Polish at that time, and it's, it's called Polish Hill in Kansas City, Kansas. And then my other grandparents were from the Missouri side, in Kansas City, Missouri. In fact, they lived on Kensington, and my mom went to East. So she is super excited that I'm here at Kansas City Public Schools. I've been very fortunate to live, work, and study in many countries around the world. In fact, I just moved back from Senegal, West Africa. Do you know your continents? <laughs> I remember the song that my daughter's teacher taught them when they were in elementary school. Maybe it's something that you've heard before. Asia, Africa, North and South America, Europe, Australia, Antarctica, too. So how did you know your continents? Do you learn it through a song? Or did you go to another country on another continent? So I want to take you to a few places around the world today for our segment. Africa, my favorite continent right now, but I've not been to every continent. Senegal, one of the most welcoming countries in the world. I would say the population is about 98% Muslim, and I felt the most welcomed than anywhere else besides maybe Morocco, another country in Africa, a little further north. I was fortunate to receive a scholarship to go to Morocco, and I lived there for a while and was able to visit many different cities, see some incredible places, and I want the same for you. But I want to talk about how we introduce ourselves when there, we're in these different places around the world. And so I want to start off with Europe, where I have family in France. The capital of France is Paris, which is where they live. And when you introduce yourself in Paris, you kiss on the cheek if you're someone your age not on the mouth but you kiss each other on the cheek like this and actually how many times you kiss depends on where you live in france sometimes it's two sometimes it's three sometimes it's four and you have to know these things because you can you imagine this has happened to me so many times. You're kissing on the cheek, and then you hesitate. Do you do three? Do you do four? You have to know how many times you're actually supposed to kiss, because you might actually kiss on the mouth if you don't know these, these facts before you go. So make sure you research. 
Obviously they speak French in France, but it wasn't always like that. Julius Caesar, he was an emperor. You may have heard about him from your history class. He wanted to conquer the world. And so he took his soldiers and they went to all these different places in Europe and one place was Gaul and he wanted them to learn Latin but they couldn't get it and so combining Gaul with Latin actually became French and that's why we call it a romance language because it came from Rome, which is where Julius Caesar was. Similarly, in a southern country, Spain is also a romance, Spanish is also a romance language. Same story, Julius Caesar went there, he wanted them to speak Latin, they did not, they developed their own language and they speak Spanish, another language that we offer in Kansas City Public Schools, French and Spanish. And in Spain, they introduce themselves very similarly to the French. Adults tend to shake hands. But someone your age, certainly from kindergarten to 12th grade, might kiss each other on the cheek just like they do in France. I've even seen individuals kiss each other on the mouth for the first time that they introduce themselves. And so that may seem shocking to us at first, but you have to understand the culture um, and recognize that just because it's different does not mean that it's wrong. Another uh, continent is Asia. My daughters were born in Okinawa, Japan, and they have a different way of introducing themselves than kissing one another on the cheek. They bow. You may have heard that before. I loved living in Okinawa, Japan, but it was hard for me at times. I couldn't read what was written on the stores, and so sometimes I found myself entering these places that were not at all like I had expected. And I had experiences that I could never have had in Kansas City or in other countries around the world. Probably my most shocking story. I arrived in Japan and three months later, I was still trying to understand the language and the culture and how you introduce yourself and what that's like. And I remember going to this American store to return some movies because I, I couldn't speak the language very well at the time and, and so I, you know, I sought out a lot of things to entertain me and, and I heard the screaming in the background and I thought, what is going on? And I, because I didn't speak the language, I, I couldn't tell very well if I should help and it was dark and this woman kept screaming. And so I remember dropping my videos, going to this woman who was being robbed. And this, this man was trying to take her bag and we went round and round. And finally he punched me in the stomach and I let go because at the time I was three months pregnant. And so I went into the, the store and I said to the owner, Joe, he was this guy from New York. I said, Joe, I explained exactly what happened. And this woman came in after me and she says, I think that that guy just ran upstairs. I said, oh my gosh. And Joe said to his wife, who was Japanese, Kuniko, 
get your bat! And so Kuniko went to get his bat and they went up and he got this guy. We went to the police station. This is the craziest thing ever. I had to answer all these questions and when they were typing, you know, they would type something and all these characters would come up. It took four hours because they were so good about all their questions. You know, why did I choose those videos and all of that? And so finally that ended and I went home and my husband was like, where have you been? And I explained the situation and, and he called his boss. And the next thing I know, I'm at the police station and there's 50 police officers and they said, Arigato gozaimasu. And they all bowed to the floor out of respect for me, for what I had done. Wow. And so Japan was incredibly interesting. Um, it is on the continent of Asia, another country in Asia is China. And that's the fourth language that we offer in Kansas City Public Schools, French, Spanish, Latin, and Chinese. I've been to Hong Kong and Macau, and they speak Cantonese, but on mainland China, they actually have a common language of Mandarin. And that is what we teach here in Kansas City Public Schools, Mandarin Chinese. Another continent is North America. My brother and his family live in Canada, which is a country in North America. It's to the north of the United States. And they have two languages that they speak in Canada, French and English. Their customs are very similar to those here in the United States. And uh, they're actually similar to us in that they're heterogeneous and that means there are many different uh, cultures and um, just like in the United States, which is so wonderful. I, I love that about the United States and, and Canada. And that was very different um, in Japan is that they're a homogenous culture. So it's, it's the same. Um, China's like that as well. Another um, family member, my family um, that speaks Spanish at home, my dad and his wife, who is from Venezuela, and that's why they speak Spanish. Venezuela is a country in South America uh, you may have heard of. So it's imperative that you learn how to introduce yourself properly. You want to make sure that you're being as respectful as you possibly can so that if you are in Japan, that you're saying your name, but you're also bowing. If you are in France or any other country that speaks French, usually you would introduce yourself and then you would do la bise. And in Spanish speaking countries, there's, there are so many. So how do they introduce themselves? Are all the customs the same? Do you introduce yourself in Spain the same way that you introduce yourself in Mexico? These are aspects that you're going to learn when you take a language at Kansas City Public Schools. You learn about the vocabulary and you learn about the customs for the culture. So as I leave you today, I would like to ask you two questions and one action step. So two questions and one action step. Or as they would do in France, two questions and one action step. So the first question, where do you want to travel? Pick a country. Where do you want to go? Which language do you need to learn to be able to visit that country? 
and learn about the customs to introduce yourself properly. And then finally, the action step. How are you going to make that happen? So thank you for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you for all the episodes in World Languages. Every week we'll have a different teacher who will talk about what they teach in their class, whether it's in French class, Spanish, Latin, or Chinese. I would like for you to travel the world with your teacher at Kansas City Public Schools. Thank you for traveling with me today. Goodbye. Our objective is basically to compare the economic strengths and weaknesses of the North and the South before immediately following the Civil War. And compare the patterns of po population distribution, demographics, migration patterns in the United States, and the impact of those patterns in community life. And you'll be able to explain the connections between the historical context of people, perspectives, and the American history. So our essential questions. What were the major events that basically are the outcome of the Civil War? How was the rule of law impacted of American society? And how did industrialization impact the United States? Our key vocabulary for today, Federal Republic, Confederacy, Donification, Secession, and Political Sovereignty. As you can see, during this time, America was expanding. So, America basically had to decide, are these new states going to be free or are they going to be slave states? A lot of people wanted states to choose. The North wanted basically the, wanted them to choose what states enter the Union. Basically, if they're going to be slave states or are they going to be free states? So, our five causes. Economic, social differences between the North and the South. States versus federal rights under the Constitution. Non-slave states proponents versus slave state proponents, the growth of the abolitionist movement, and the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 were all the causes of the Civil War. The economic and social differences. The South, basically, they want to intervene basically with the cotton gin, largely on one crop economy, depending on slavery. The North, economy was based more industrial than agriculture. These guys had the banking systems. These guys had these big industrial complexes basically driving their economy. This was a Hamilton thinking process. Basically, it came into fruition during this time frame. The South was based on plantation system, while the North was focused on the city life. Uh, lots of people in these, in these communities. People of different culture and classes had to work to come together in the North. While in the South, they continued to hold this antiquated social order of this planter, basically higher class. Then in 1861, the Morale Tariff, basically taxed on imports, instead protected North manufacturing at the expense of the South. So, we're going to talk about Western expansion. Missouri played a big part in this process. Maine would enter as a free state, while Missouri would enter as a slave state in 1820. Territories of north of Missouri will remain free. This was temporarily settled dispute, basically a Western expansion of slavery, and it had a balance that maintained. So, Missouri, 1820. Civil War didn't happen until another 40 years. So why did this play a big part into it? As you can see, here's the population distribution. Yes, the South got political advantage over having slaves in their state. Remember, we talked about the three-fifths compromise early in the year. Now, this is coming to fruition and basically playing, this, the, playing a part into it. So, as you can see, the economic differences. You can see these cities are built on basically industry. Compared to the South, you see how it's built on agrarian. Basically, the cotton was running the South. So, Henry Clay, the great compromiser, he basically created the Missouri Compromise and the Compromise of 1850. The Compromise of 1850 allowed states to enter the Union, basically that we gained from the Mexican-American War. What is it? With the war with Mexico, it expanded, and even further west. So now we have this idea of manifest destiny playing a part in the Civil War, too. 
it had basically five, 525,000 square miles in U.S. territory. It had Arizona, Nevada, California, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. Mexico also gave up uh, basic claims to Texas. So now Texas becomes a free and independent state. Now we have the William Provo the one mile Provaso. Basically, with new territories repeated, the question whether slavery should be allowed and spread. David Wilmot proposed neither slavery nor involuntary, involuntary servitude shall, shall serve exist in Western territories. The Wilmot Proviso passed the House of Representatives, but it failed the Senate. John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, he argued that landowners should be able to take their property out west. When we talk about property, we're talking about people. So, again, we have these other people. They said, no, we have a moral compass. The end is practice of slavery. Harry B. Stowe, she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. She talked about the horrors of slavery. Frederick Douglass, to me, was probably the first civil, well, I'll take that back. I would say the first. I would say probably one of the more greater name, name, uh, names in American history. He basically was saying it's a moral obligation to end this practice of, of basically chattel property. Harriet Tubman, she freed many slaves, moving to the north. John Brown, he basically tried to end the practice of, uh, of spreading slavery out west. And basically, we talk about Kansas, and basically Kansas became a territory. But it probably, probably became the first, I'd say, shots fired of the Civil War. Because you had issues coming with Kansas and Missouri and talk about the spreading, you know, spreading of slavery in the 1850s. So Jordan H. True talked about the horrors of slavery. William Garrison, he was basically this huge, like, radical proponent of, of ending this practice of, of bondage, of slavery, of man. And he wrote books about it. And he was a huge radical when it comes to basically a revolution and this idea of ending this practice. Again, these are the new territories. As you can see, Utah Territory, 1850, New Mexico. Many Southern uh, politicians want these states to be able to choose. Basically choose, do they want to become slave states or do they want to become free states? So I wanted to go back and talk about the Compromise of 1850. This will allow basically California to enter as a free state. There will be no restrictions on slavery in the Mexican secession. So these two states will actually become slave states. And the slave trade in the District of Columbia will be outlawed. Not slavery, because those guys who had slaves will be grandfathered in. But the slave trade in Washington, D.C. would end. And Southerners were allowed greater power to recover slaves who escaped north. With the 1835 Future Slave Law, basically the north had to return these slaves back. But many Northerners said, you know what, we're not going to do that. They let all these uh, Africans who, is, well, African Americans or blacks uh, basically escaped. They allowed them to live free, which basically they wanted to do. But with the Compromise of 1850, it was guaranteed to, uh, to bring them back. So slave owners could point out and get them returned with no proof needed. So literally, a free black man in, a, say, New York City could be walking down the street some guy from South Carolina said that's my former slave. With no proof needed, he can basically pull him back and drag him to South Carolina as his slave. And basically, ordinary citizens were required to catch fugitive slaves. So no longer did you have this peace. Frederick Douglass, who was an escaped slave, turned social reformer in a speech against the new law, featured as an abolitionist liberator. He said, this practice is immoral. It basically does not keep to the ideas of American society. Dred Scott case, 1857. Supreme Court declared that slaves were not citizens and they could not sue in federal courts. They declared the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional. That Congress did not have the authority to prohibit slavery in these territories. Dred Scott lived in St. Louis. He was free. They had to return him back to slavery. The Dred Scott decision was overturned 
by the 13th and 14th Amendment some 20 years later. The Nebraska-Kansas Act debates over whether the northern and southern starting point of the Transcontinental Railroad led to an argument over slavery in these new territories. The act organized Nebraska as a territory to win southern support proposed and inclined basic support for Kansas. Each allowed to decide an issue through popular sovereignty. The Missouri Compromise banned expansion of slavery in the region was undone. The Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1869 after the Civil War. So let's talk about John Brown bleeding Kansas. Northerners rushed to Kansas to create this anti-slavery state. People living among the Missouri border rushed over to vote illegally for a pro-slavery legislature. Immediate anti-slavery sentiments. So now we have two governors in the state of Kansas. One anti-slavery, one pro-slavery. The pro-slavery border ruffians clashed with the Jayhawks. Basically, Jayhawks is a guerrilla band supporting a free state. In 1856, they rushed the, the, the uh, capital of Kansas, Lawrence, sparked by a guerrilla war that Kansas lasted months. Basically, it led to a raid on, on Kansas. Confederate guerrillas killed 2,000 people, damaged $2 million worth of property, and anti-slave sentiment. That basically becomes the John Brown, how he becomes famous. He also has a role into this. He raided Harper's Ferry in 1859. He tried to take federal weapons and arsenal from Harper's Ferry, basically with escaped slaves, and killed, 17 were killed. Brown and four of his men were convicted of treason and hanged in the public square, December 2nd, 1859. Despite a quick failure, Brown planned a slave revolt. Basically, he became a martyr for abolitionists in the cause. Many people didn't want to get involved with John Brown because he thought he was crazy, but they realized that his, his position and his passion, basically for the abolitionist movement, created this fear in him, basically to end this, this horror of slavery. This also led to the Lincoln-Douglas debates. So, you had this newcomer, House Representative Abraham Lincoln. He was debating a senator, Stephen Douglas, about basically the expansion of slavery and how slavery should look. Lincoln, he really didn't care about the idea of slavery, but he was saying to keep power and the balance of the government basically within, to keep basically this union together there needs to be some type of balance. People believe that argument. People basically, his profile grew. Douglas, Douglas ended up winning this election, but by 1860, people knew who Abraham Lincoln was, and he became the Republican, Republican candidate for, for the president. He, won in the, he basically won because the Democratic field was totally different. The Democratic field was split. You had Douglas, basically, they consider him a northerner, and Stephen Breckinridge from the south. So basically, Lincoln won because the Democratic field was split. So now, the election of Abraham Lincoln, this led to succession in the south. Many southerners didn't approve of Abraham Lincoln. They didn't want him. So now you have this country starting to split apart over this issue of slavery. If anybody ever tells you that the issue of slavery did not wasn't part of the Civil War, they're telling you a lie. Because economically, politically, and socially, these that issue basically ran the American society. These two men is featured in the next lesson. Basically, we're going to talk about the Civil War. At the start of the Civil War, this man was broke, didn't have anything to live for. This man was rich, had a whole bunch of slaves. He's basically a superstar going into the Civil War. He turns out an appointment and goes to the Confederacy. We'll talk about that now in next week's Hello, my name is Paul Turner, Social Studies Coordinator for Kansas City Public Schools. And we're going here to talk to you about life after World War II. Times were changing, and basically America was growing in prosperity. But were all Americans prospering? We're going to discuss that in this next lecture. All right, you have this long economic boom from the 1940s and 1960s. What we call Main Street America was growing, so economics were booming during this time frame. U.S. economy was booming. 
from 1940s to 1960s. It was a great time. Basically, you could provide work. Basically, you had time to spend with your kids. Women were working outside of the home. Basically, they entered the workforce at greater numbers during this time frame. So this provided more uh, money basically spent on the outside world. And you had great uh, leadership. You had basically Truman and his assurances and policies maintain building preparation for war. And we'll build and we'll be, build businesses for the United States in a considerable time period ahead. This time was a great time to be an American. Prosperity built massive government projects, such as the federal highway system. Government spending, aerospace spending, electronics, plastics, research and development industries were blooming during this time period. For the average American worker, productivity rose, farming uh, out, uh, excuse me, output increased, and led to less people actually farming. Plus, you had these cheap sources of energy coming through this, during this time period. Basically, it led to an expansion of the auto, housing industries, factories were expanding. So basically, if you were basically looking for a job in the city, more than likely you could find one. Then you had these political regions started booming and popping. If you can see, the Sun Belt flourished due to cheaper taxes and energy. Places like California, Texas, and Florida became these political powerhouses. As you can see, after this time period, how many presidents come from these regions? The Sun Belt became important as the Northeast population moved to the South. So as people were retiring, they started coming down South, because guess what? It's warmer in the South, guys. You get basically nine months of basically summer, spring weather. Oh, there we go. All right. So let's talk about what else is going on. You have the growth of what we call suburbs. So let's talk about one of the biggest suburbs that happened during this time period, Levittown, Long Island. Prosperity and availability of the car led to suburb suburbanization. Plus, you had the interstate highway system allow people to travel longer distance. So now, think about this. Let's think about this in Kansas City. Now I can live in Liberty, but I can work in Kansas City, right? Prior to 1940, 1950, that drive would have been terrible because you know what? It's probably mostly dirt roads. Now we have two lane highway systems that allow you to go back and forth on a daily basis. So by 1949, William Levitz basically produced 150 houses per week. He was just cranking them out, cranking them out. So we become the suburban nation in the 1950s. So now this all plays a part of the political theater going basically moving forward. We talk about the civil rights movement. We talk about the Cold War. I got a TV. I work in the city. My, when I come home, I'm going to sit there and watch my TV because I, just, I can drive back and forth to work. And guess what I get to see? The nightly news. I get to see all these things getting played out on the nightly news and it actually might get me more politically motivated to vote for the candidate I want. All right? So 11 home, basically in the suburbs, costs about $7,900. Today, that's about $76,000. Levitt offered a deal, half down, and 10 years to pay it off the balance. The FHA offered a 30-year mortgage, 5% down with 2% interest. All right. So now, let's talk about life out in the suburbs. You had a shift in this population. By 1960, you had 30% of Americans living in the suburbs. So we had a huge population shift during this time period. 30% living in the suburbs now, no longer living in the cities. Innovators like Levitt Brothers designed cheap, boring houses in the suburbs. Cheap and boring sells in America. It always has and always will. Suburban living, basically, you had a one-story home, basically 12 foot by 19 foot living room, two bedrooms, tiled bathrooms. You had a garage, a small backyard, and a front lawn. Again, by 1960, a third of American population lived in the suburbs. So what did that do to our cities? 
we have this term what we call white flight. Basically, you left a lot of the white uh, uh, people who lived in the cities actually shifted to the suburbs. And this left cities for the poor and African Americans. And basically, you saw this tax base shifting to the suburbs. We still deal with this issue today when we talk about funding of schools, when we talk about funding of roads. Our tax base has shifted to the suburbs. The return of the soldiers and the economic prosperity also led to what we call the baby boom. So now we have all these, we have this huge population that shifted to the suburbs. They get to see the nightly news. So we just want to start seeing basically the, the roots of the civil rights movement. We start seeing basically these veterans returning home as the fighting this war. We start seeing veterans fighting the Korean War. So they started coming home wanting to use some of their VA, VA benefits. Start seeing wanting to use basically going to school and basically getting turned away. And now you start seeing this more of no, basically, I, I love this country more than basically what this country loves me as. So the roots of the civil rights movement. Basically, the 14th Amendment states, no state shall abridge the privileges of citizens of the United States, nor deny any person within the jurisdiction equal protection of the laws. So now, as a veteran, if I'm coming back to the United States, I'm not getting the same equal protection of the laws. I'm still treated as a second-class citizen. The civil rights protect individual freedoms, ensure the abilities to participate in civil political life. Down south, this wasn't happening. Many times that they had to pass this literacy, uh, this literacy test or pass to basically pay a tax to be able to vote. So now you see these, you start seeing this basically this idea of one man, one vote society. African Americans. Civil rights were denied by black codes and Jim Crow's in the South, passed by southern, southern states and organizations like the KKK. So what you see now in political life compared to today, you start seeing remnants of this, of this second-class citizenry. Basically, we want to tear down these walls now. 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, established basically public segregation. The idea of the separate, uh, separate but equal facilities. This includes housing. This includes schools. So now we're living in this two American society. Blacks were energized by the Populist Party in the 1890s, began voting in higher numbers. Southern states added voter qualifications. Again, the poll tax. Again, the literacy test. Basically, denied African Americans the right to vote. States created basically these literacy tests. Basically, black schools are underfunded. Still today, we're still dealing with some of the same issues of underfunding of African American, and let's say let's, let's not just say African American, a minority school districts. You start seeing these grandfather clause. Basically, exempt uh, people from literacy tests if their grandfathers voted in 1860. In 1860. Guess who wasn't able to vote? Basically, who was free in American society in 1860? Basically, the Civil War happened in 1861, 1865. So African-Americans were not able to participate in basically political society. Early 1900s, 20% of eligible black voters actually voted. They were intimidated. They were discriminated. They had to pay a poll tax. They put all these parameters, shifting the goalposts for people to vote. By the early 1900s, Jim Crow continued in the South. It was nearly complete segregation. African Americans had their own drinking systems. They had to go pick, if they wanted to go eat out, they had to go pick up their food from the back. They had to sit in the back of the bus. You had these vigilante justice, basically KKK, formed lynchings. Basically, this became an American system. White murderers rarely, rarely face punishment. Black leaders like W.E. Du Bois, du Bois uh, Booker T. Washington, and the NAACP fought injustices, but few politicians moved into action. 1920s, you saw Marcus Garvey, United Negro Improvement Association, urging blacks to separate themselves from American society. 
the movement back to Africa. His quote, our success educationally, industrially, and politically is based upon protection of a nation founded ourselves and the nation cannot nowhere else be in Africa. Daughter, Daughters of the American Revolution refused to allow American Anderson based on performing the Constitutional Hall of Event. So, Eleanor Roosevelt resigns from the Daughters of the American Revolution. She says that African Americans need the right to vote. They need the right to participate in American society. She becomes basically an ally to, the American, to this new system. A. Philip Randolph, leader of the Brotherhood of Sleep Car, Car Porters. He played a march on Washington. FDR issued an executive order banning discrimination on the workplace. Let the nation know the meaning of our numbers. We are not pressure group. We are an organization. We are not a mob. We are an advanced guard of the mass of moral revolution confined in the Negro, nor is it confined to civil rights. For our white allies know that they are not free while we are not. A. Philip Randolph. Even in sports, African Americans had to participate different. Jackie Robinson, he didn't break the color barrier to 1947. Few African Americans cared about civil rights, but this change became their inspiration. I thank you guys for joining me. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Thank you. Hey, bonjour les élèves, ça va? Monsieur Vinemont ici. Je vais vous expliquer aujourd'hui comment préparer un podcast. Préparation de mon podcast. Je m'appelle Philippe Vinemont. Alors, l'objectif, the student will be able to create a short podcast in French according to their French level. They will be able to record it and publish it. Those are the standard 11C 1.3A. C'est quoi un podcast? Podcast is an audio program just like talk radio, but you subscribe to it on your smartphone or computer and listen to it whenever you like. Un podcast, c'est un contenu audio numérique que l'on peut écouter n'importe où, n'importe quand, grâce à la technologie du flux RSS. Voilà la petite explication. Maintenant, nous allons continuer et voir aussi un peu plus. Un podcast, any length, any frequency, any format, any topic. Donc la longueur que vous voulez, la fréquence, tous les jours, daily, tous les mois, monthly, tout le format, simple, very simple, ou compliqué, compliqué, it's long. Et les topics, vous choisissez, any topic you want, Peut être avec un podcast. Voilà. Alors, écoutons un peu quelques secondes d'un podcast en français que des collègues ont fait et nous allons écouter la simplicité. Bonjour, simple monsieur. Vous vous appelez comment, s'il vous plaît Je m'appelle monsieur Delpech. Vous pouvez l'épeler, s'il vous plaît Bien sûr. D, E, L, P, E, accent circonflexe, C, H, E. Merci. Et quel est votre prénom, s'il vous plaît Fabien. Merci. Voilà. Donc, on peut continuer. Vous pourrez aller voir vous-même tout le podcast. Vous avez vu que dans ce cas-ci, c'était un interview. Podcast peut être un interview. OK. Maintenant, nous allons faire notre podcast. Et je vais faire le mien. Et voilà. La première question que nous répondons, comment t'appelles-tu hmm. En prenant la phrase, comment t'appelles-tu Nous allons écrire la réponse et je vais faire ici, euh, je m'appelle Philippe. Ok Voilà. Ou alors, pardon, voilà. Ou alors on pourrait dire peut-être un peu plus compliqué Salut, c'est Philippe, ok, bienvenue sur mon podcast, vous êtes en level 1 ou level 2, vous êtes 
différents. Salut, c'est Philippe, bienvenue sur mon podcast. Ok Alors, voilà, on a écrit les phrases, nous les avons maintenant, on pourra utiliser ce, cela pour le podcast. Deuxième question, quelle est ta nationalité Nationalité Oh, ok, je sais, nationalité, je suis belge et américain. Belge et américain. Je vais écrire ma phrase, voici ma préparation, ça a du sens. Je suis euh, belge et américain. Je suis belge et américain. Ok, voilà. Nous sommes donc là. Nous avons déjà deux phrases. Si vous pouvez regarder, voilà. On peut voir. Je m'appelle Philippe. Salut, c'est Philippe. Je suis belge et américain. Nous formons des phrases. Quel âge as-tu L'âge, ok, oh, je sais ça. L'âge as-tu, c'est moi. Quel âge est-ce que j'ai euh, J'ai 58 ans. Voilà. Hein? Voilà. Alors, voilà. On peut dire j'ai... Euh, 58 ans, ou alors on peut faire plus compliqué, compliqué, je suis né en 1962, ok, je suis né en 1962, plus compliqué, parfait, parfait, nous avons déjà beaucoup de choses maintenant, j'ai 58 ans, je suis né en 1962, nous continuons les phrases, tu as des sœurs des frères, des enfants. Enfants, oui. Deux garçons. Oui, j'ai deux garçons. Voilà, oui. J'ai deux garçons. Voilà. Oui. J'ai deux garçons. Léo et Loïc. Vous avez remarqué, je n'ai pas mis les accents, des accents... C'est pas grave pour l'instant, c'est un podcast. Alors, mais j'ai aussi un frère, une sœur. J'ai aussi, j'ai aussi un frère et une sœur. Voilà, encore des phrases, c'est très intéressant. Nous avons maintenant ceci. Oui, j'ai deux garçons, Léo et Loïc. J'ai aussi un frère et une sœur. Je vais juste rectifier ici. Voilà, nous, nous faisons le podcast ensemble. Et je vois déjà maintenant que nous avons pas mal de phrases qui se construisent. Voilà, je m'appelle Philippe. Ah oh oui, on est peut-être là maintenant. Voilà, je suis belge américain. J'ai 58 ans. Je suis né en 1962. J'ai deux garçons, Léo et Loïc. J'ai aussi un frère et une sœur, Patrick et Pascal. Ok, maintenant allons euh, toujours ici, la dernière question, quel est ton animal préféré Dans mon cas, j'aime les chiens, voilà, j'aime les chiens, voilà, on pourrait dire j'aime, ok, j'aime les chiens, on peut dire euh, j'adore les chiens, j'adore les chiens, voilà, j'aime les chiens, j'adore les chiens, petite phrase facile, et vous pouvez même dire, le chien, j'adore les chiens, j'adore les bergers allemands, j'adore les colis, etc. Et vous avez toujours ceci qui revient avec notre podcast qui augmente. Nous avons vraiment fait un podcast très facile pour le numéro 1, le level 1. Il reste une question, quelle est ta nourriture préférée Nourriture préférée, moi, j'aime le tiramisu, c'est italien. Ouh, voilà, moi, voilà. Moi, j'aime le euh, tiramisu. Je crois que c'est comme ça, tiramisu. C'est excellent, etc. Nous allons maintenant, voilà, euh, aller dans ce qui est facile. Je vais maintenant vous parler d'autre chose. Mais d'abord, ok, revoyons euh, le podcast que vous pouvez faire au level 1. Voilà. Bonjour, on pourrait rajouter bonjour, ça ce serait peut-être quelque chose d'excellent, de, peut-être dire bonjour d'abord, ok, voilà, bonjour, voilà, ok, nous allons faire un petit peu mieux, bonjour, je m'appelle Philippe, ou salut, c'est Philippe, bienvenue sur mon podcast, je suis belge et américain, j'ai 58 ans, je suis né en 1962, j'ai deux garçons, Léo 
et Loïc, pas trois ans et dix ans. J'ai aussi un frère, Patrick, et une sœur, Pascal. Alors, je vais mettre le nom de mon frère et ma sœur. Voilà, nous allons rectifier un peu. J'ai aussi un frère, Patrick, et deux sœurs, pardon, deux sœurs, j'ai deux sœurs. Deux sœurs. Pascal et Patricia. Patricia, voilà, très bien. Donc maintenant, elle est toujours là aussi, parfait. Euh, les deux sœurs, Pascal et Patricia. Et j'aime les chiens, j'adore les chiens. J'aime le tiramisu, c'est excellent. On peut dire c'est excellent, voilà, excellent. Le tiramisu, c'est excellent, voilà. C'est... Ex, ex, c'est là. Voilà, maintenant c'était facile, nous sommes là-bas. Alors maintenant nous allons aller à un autre niveau. Si vous avez fait le level 1, c'est fini pour vous, c'est bien. Maintenant nous allons aller peut-être level 2, level 3. Alors euh, niveau 2, niveau 3. Alors, quelle est une activité que tu aimes Moi, j'aime les montres. Alors je vais écrire, ok J'aime acheter des montres et réparer des montres, ok J'aime acheter des montres et euh, les modifier et parfois les réparer voilà les réparer donc nous allons maintenant parler de moi de mon hobby de mon activité j'aime bien les montres et voilà euh, regardez je vais pas vous mentir j'aime bien de, de porter des montres qui sont assez intéressantes j'ai apporté quelques montres pour que vous voyez un peu, d'une petite partie de ma collection, voilà. Par exemple, cette montre-ci que vous allez voir ressemble très fort à la montre que vous voyez voir. Ce sont des, c'est pas ça peut être copie, mais c'est le genre. Les montres les plus belles du monde, vous avez beaucoup de noms français. FP Journe, ok, Richard Mille, Patek Philippe, voilà Patek Philippe, vous avez la Rolex bien entendu, ok. Vous avez bien sûr Audemars Piguet. Piguet, okay, c'est un nom français, Audemars Piguet, et alors euh, le FP Journe est ici, ça c'est la Patek Philippe qui est très connue, la Rolex, et là c'est la Vacheron Constantin. Voilà, bon, je vous montre quelques, quelques articles de, ma, de ma, mes collections, okay. on peut avoir des petites montres ou des grandes montres, et nous allons, voilà, j'ai ici des montres très grandes, qui sont qui font très grosses au, au niveau de la main, voilà, on peut regarder comme ça, une autre montre aussi, qui ne sont pas des montres chères. Voilà une montre très classique, voilà que j'aime beaucoup. Voilà, nous avons des montres, voilà qui sont très classiques avec un costume, etc. Et peut-être encore une dernière qui ressemble à la Rolex. Ce n'est pas une Rolex, mais c'est une de mes préférées. Voilà, c'est ce qu'on appelle la Rolex. Voilà, avec l'écran vert que vous pouvez voir ici. Je ne sais pas si vous voyez bien. Voilà. Et alors, c'est pour vous montrer que j'ai une passion pour les montres, et je répare parfois, etc. Alors, voilà, j'ai écrit une petite chose pour mon podcast, maintenant. Voilà, j'ai écrit ceci. Les montres de qualité peuvent être très chères. Elles peuvent coûter plus cher qu'une voiture. J'aime collectionner les montres, mais je ne peux pas acheter les montres chères. Alors, je collectionne les montres bon marché. J'aime regarder des vidéos qui parlent de montres de qualité et ça me fait rêver. J'ai un petit kit de réparation de montres et je sais changer les piles et modifier les bracelets. Modifier les bracelets. J'essaie de faire de petites réparations, mais c'est difficile. Voilà, j'ai fait donc mon podcast et je vais vous demander, comme travail, de faire votre propre podcast en utilisant le link qui s'appelle Encore. Voilà, vous allez avoir le link, vous allez aller sur Encore. Je vais maintenant utiliser ce lien ici, voilà, pour faire euh, mon podcast et je vais faire un nouvel épisode de euh, mon podcast, voilà, je vais commencer à, à, voilà, pouvoir enregistrer, record, et je peux toujours euh, sauver, save épisode, et alors ce sera publié sur mon podcast, voilà, si je fais une faute, je peux toujours à ce moment, alors, euh, modifier, Continuer. Voilà. Nous allons maintenant faire le podcast et nous aurons fini la leçon. Je vais vous montrer comment moi je vais faire mon podcast.
Je vais commencer à cette slide-ci et nous allons parler. Attention, enregistrement, tout le monde se tait, ok Attention, on va faire le record. Bonjour, je m'appelle Philippe et hey, salut Hey, c'est Philippe, bienvenue sur mon podcast. Vous savez, je suis belge et américain. J'ai 58 ans. C'est-à-dire que je suis né en 1962. Oui, j'ai deux garçons. J'ai un garçon qui s'appelle Léo, il a 23 ans, et un garçon qui s'appelle Loïc, il n'a que 10 ans. J'ai aussi un frère Patrick et deux sœurs, Pascal et Patricia. Mon animal préféré, c'est le chien. J'aime le chien, les chiens. J'adore les chiens. Et voilà Maintenant aussi, ma nourriture préférée, c'est le tiramisu, parce que c'est excellent. J'adore le tiramisu aussi. Lorsque l'on parle d'une activité que j'aime ou d'un hobby, d'une expérience, d'une spécialité, euh, j'aime vraiment euh, acheter des montres et les modifier et parfois les réparer. Par exemple, il y a des montres qui m'attirent, des montres très chères, comme FP Jaune, Richard Mille, Patek Philippe, Vacheron, Rolex, etc. Mais voilà... Euh, Lorsqu'on doit parler des montres, ça peut être très cher. Les montres de qualité peuvent être très très chères. Elles peuvent coûter plus cher qu'une voiture, plus cher qu'une Ferrari. J'aime collectionner les montres, mais je ne peux pas acheter les montres chères. Alors, je collectionne des montres jolies, mais bon marché. J'aime regarder des vidéos qui parlent de montres de qualité, et ça me fait rêver. J'ai un petit kit de réparation de montres, et je sais, je sais, je sais changer les piles changer et modifier les bracelets. J'essaie de faire de petites réparations aussi, mais c'est difficile. Voilà, vous savez un peu l'histoire, c'était mon podcast aujourd'hui. J'espère que vous allez aimer. À bientôt. Salut Well, that is all for today. We like to thank our teachers and thank you for joining us. Again, my name is Justin Robinson, your homeroom instructor. And remember to always continue to learn throughout the day.